Good morning. We start business today with general questions. Question number one from Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with South Lancashire Council and the Integrated Joint Board regarding residential care homes. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Uh, the Scottish Government is aware of plans to modernise South Lanarkshire Council residential care facilities in keeping with the Integration Joint Board's strategic commissioning plan to deliver a more flexible care model for older people. Uh, we have uh, not had any direct discussions about the configuration of services, as, th as these are matters for local determination. An integration meeting between Scottish Government officials and representatives from the Integration Authority, the NHS Board and the Council will take place on the 23rd of May. Monica Lennon. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. South Lancashire Council's care homes have an excellent reputation and they're valued by residents and their families. The Cabinet Secretary talked about modernisation, but the Council is looking to close care homes and 100, 100 long-term beds could be lost across South Lanarkshire if the proposals are implemented in full. Does the Minister or does the Cabinet Secretary agree that local communities are right to be concerned given the projected 25% increase in the over 75 population in our area in the 10 years leading up to 2026? And whilst I appreciate it's a local decision, can the Cabinet Secretary advise what national guidance is available to councils who are looking to close care homes? Cabinet Secretary. So my understanding is that the current model of delivery has remained static for over 20 years and I think anyone would understand therefore that the current model no longer is fit for purpose in terms of significant changes not only in demographic demand but in where uh, people want to receive uh, care and in the complexity of their needs. In addition, four of the eight care homes are ageing. So what I understand South Lanarkshire uh, is doing is developing an innovative, flexible care model. They undertook in 2016 a pilot test of change with existing care facilities through the provision of 22 intermediate transitional beds and increased focus on enabling so that people could return home. Of those people supported, 56% successfully returned home, supporting that proposition. So what I will uh, be interested in seeing is how they want to remodel and reconfigure uh, the balance of care in order to uh, respond to what we know are people's uh, uh, preferences, which is uh, to receive care at home if that is possible or in a homely setting and to see the effective use of intermediate care beds and enabling services. And that is why the uh, purpose of the meeting that will be held later in May with my officials will be to look and see two things. Uh, what is the shape of that remodelling? Uh, what has been uh, the level of consultation, which I understand uh, to date has been significant? Uh, and what is the phased proposition uh, from that idea? IJB so that we can be sure that they are addressing uh, what they uh, can evidence by way of local need and local demand. Graeme Simpson. Thank you. Uh, I'm encouraged to hear that that meeting will be taking place, but this whole move to get people um, out of care homes and uh, in, back into the community, staying in their own homes, started in South Lanarkshire under a Labour council when both Monica Lennon and myself were councillors there. Does the uh, Cabinet Secretary not agree that this smacks of hypocrisy from the Labour Party? Cabinet Secretary. Well, that's not for me to comment. Um, members will draw their own conclusions from that. But of course, Mr Simpson is absolutely right that in some uh, aspects, in terms of uh, our developing thinking on integration and the need uh, and desire uh, for people to receive the care uh, that they require uh, in their own home or in a homely setting uh, was founded in some measure on the impact and the innovation that South Lanarkshire uh, Council introduced and we are of course grateful to, that, to them for that and of course the whole point about uh, health and social care partnerships and integrated joint boards is that they uh, can take account of the needs of their local population and commission and plan the redesign of services in order to meet that need. And in that instance, uh, I wouldn't want diktats from any central government to intervene with those important uh, local decisions, uh, albeit that we need to make sure that they are properly consulted on and that the care on offer is one that is safe, effective and person-centred. Question number two, James Kelly. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve performance on ScotRail services. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Presiding <coughs> Officer, the remedial plan in place with ScotRail will aim to address performance issues. So over the last reporting period, around nine out of ten trains ran on time, the best punctuality in Scotland's railway since September last year. Within the Glasgow area, ScotRail Alliance's implementation of the Donovan recommendations has improved performance across the Strathclyde Electrics network, with the last period delivering over 1% PPM improvement compared to the previous period. Network Rail's £5 million investment in delivering consistently, is delivering consistently high PPM uh, of above 94% at Glasgow Central in the last three periods, with some weeks as high as 97%. James Kelly. Thank the, thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The latest figures for Glasgow Central Low Level, uh, a station widely used by passengers travelling from Rutherland and Cambus Lang, show that 51.9% of trains, more than half, did not arrive in time. These figures are atrocious and are made worse by yesterday's revelations of the Witch Survey showing that the ScotRail compensation scheme was one of the most complicated uh, in the UK, uh, with some passengers needing to retrieve 24 pieces of information to make a claim. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what he is doing to reverse these uh, drastic performance figures and will he review immediately the compensation claim at ScotRail to make it easier for passengers to claim compensation? Cabinet Secretary. Officer, on the member's latter point, um, we would expect ScotRail to look at how they can simplify the existing process to help those who are claiming compensation to be able to do so uh, as reasonably as possible. Um, on the uh, principal point which the member has raised, as I've already pointed out, the performance within the Strathclyde Electric area, which includes the lower uh, line that the member refers to, Rogel Street, uh, has, saw, uh, has saw improvements overall. Um, however, there's still more to be done. Uh, that's one of the key things that were set out within the Donovan Review in order to drive up improvement. And the £5 million of investment in the Glasgow Electrics area is about helping to make sure that's done. The member might also want to consider the report which was issued by the ORR last year, towards the end of last year, reviewing the work that's been undertaken around the Donovan recommendations and highlighted that good progress has been made, uh, but there is still more to be done. And what we need to do is to make sure that both ScotRail and Network Rail are implementing these changes in order to make sure we get the type of service improvements that we want to see being sustained on an ongoing basis. And Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Cabinet Secretary might be aware that ScotRail are trying to encourage retired drivers out of retirement and into service. Uh, is that a sign that there is a shortage uh, of drivers on ScotRail? And given that it takes 18 months to train a new driver, is he concerned, as I am, that there may be shortfalls and that will affect services? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, it should come as no surprise to the member that he would uh, recognise that within the remedial plan, ScotRail have indicated they intend to employ an extra 55 drivers in order to make sure that they've got greater resilience within their train crew numbers overall, something which we uh, support and are encouraging them to make sure they make good progress on. How they go about recruiting those drivers is a matter for them as an operational issue, but I'm sure the member would welcome uh, the provisions which were set out within a remedial plan to address the very issue around crew, crewing numbers, and that involves recruiting an extra 55 drivers. Thanks. Just to make it clear, there's, I'm not going to take the two additional members who wish to ask questions because we're not making much progress through the questions. Question three has been withdrawn. Question four, Richard Lyle. Thank you, President Officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on the noise surveys of the upgraded section of the M74. Cabinet Secretary Michael Myers. The ambient noise assessment has commenced and is expected to be completed by the end of this month. The results will be published on the Transport Scotland website as soon as they are available. In addition to this, a further ambient noise assessment will be carried out within three months of all snagging works being completed. This will establish if the ambient noise levels exceed the pre-construction ambient noise levels or the levels reported in the environmental statement. Richard Lyle. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. When the work was carried out in M74 by contractors, they removed quite a number of full-grown trees and bushes 
which acted as a noise reducer. In place of the full-grown trees and substantial bushes, through my pressure and discussions with Transport Scotland, they have now been replaced by what I can only call very few twig trees and very small bushes along the route. Local primary school and my constituents who back on M74 are not happy, as, as I am not. What more could be done, Cabinet Secretary, to alleviate the noise in this section of the motorway? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sign officer, my understanding is that the type of um, uh, trees and bushes which they tend to plant along major trunk routes are ones which are fast growing uh, in order to help to address the type of issue which the member has uh, raised. And that's my understanding of what's happened in this particular uh, instance, uh, uh, although uh, that will take a number of years for those to be fully established. What I can say to the member is that if the ambient noise assessment which has been undertaken at the present time highlights that there are ongoing issues uh, in relation to noise which are out with what was predicted uh, uh, prior to the construction of the, uh, of the M74 upgrade section, uh, then further measures may have to then be taken. But once this study has been completed, we'll then have a better understanding of those levels and whether further measures need to be implemented. Thank you. Question number five, Colin Beatty. To ask the Scottish Government how it plans to celebrate International Museum Day on the 18th of May. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. Uh, International Museums Day is a great opportunity for museums to engage with the public in creative activities. The popularity of this annual event has grown and in 2018 more than 40,000 museums participated in 158 countries. Scotland will be playing its part this year when the theme is museums as cultural hubs and I look forward to speaking at the garden lobby reception to mark International Museums Day on the 14th of May and I would encourage colleagues to attend the reception and help celebrate the event by visiting a local museum on the 18th of May. Colin Beattie. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply. The Cabinet Secretary may be aware of the parliamentary event I'm sp sponsoring on the 14th of May in conjunction with Museums Gallery Scotland. Can she outline what support the Scottish Government intends to provide to museums across Scotland this year to ensure these vital elements of local, national and global history and culture remain embedded in our communities? Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is a strong supporter of the museum sector. The 1920 budget allocates a total of over £50 million funding to support Scotland's museums and galleries, including grants and aid funding to the National Museums and National Galleries, as well as support for Scotland's three national industrial museums and the V&A and &D. We don't provide core funding to local museums as they are funded by their local authorities. However, we do support Museum Gallery Scotland, the national development body, which provides advice on all matters relating to museums and galleries. And the 2019-20 uh, budget includes £2.5 million for Museum Gallery Scotland to support the sector. Thank you very much. Question number six, Claire Adamson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government its position on the use of big data to tackle societal inequality. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government is committed to using data to improve outcomes for the people of Scotland and to help us work towards meeting our objective set out in the National Performance Framework. We use big data to inform policy and practice and tackle complex problems such as societal inequality, health and homelessness, as well as unemployment and to support work in many other portfolio areas. Uh, Claire Adamson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. According to the United Nations Women Report, Gender Equality and Big Data, Making Gender Data Visible, Big Data has an essential role to play in achieving sustainable development goals, particularly the empowerment of women. What use can the Scottish Government make of big data analytics to improve the lives of women and girls in Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Scottish Government has, as I said in my previous answer, a vision that data is used systematically to improve decision-making outcomes in the lives of our citizens. And we absolutely recognise the opportunities this creates to improve the lives for women and for girls. For example, since uh, October last year, the Government is involved uh, in the Administrative Data for Research Scotland, part of the Administrative Data Research Partnership. And that aims to champion the use of data for research in the public interest by bringing together world-leading academic research to the important social and economic challenges that we face. And this partnership builds in the first phase, which delivered insight into maternal and children's health outcomes. And we're also providing one and a half million over three years to support the establishment of a UNICEF data for children hub in Scotland. But we'll continue to explore other ways we can use uh, and improve outcomes uh, using big data and happy to further do that with Claire Adamson, who I know has particular expertise and knowledge in this field. 
Question number seven, Angela Constance. To ask the Scottish Government how it is supporting suicide prevention work in the Almond Valley constituency. Minister Claire Hockey. In August 2018, the Scottish Government published its Suicide Prevention Action Plan, Every Life Matters. This sets out 10 measures to continue the strong decline in the country's rates of deaths by suicide. It has a target to reduce the rate by 20% by 2022 from a 2017 baseline. The approach to suicide prevention work in West Lothian is currently under review, and once this review is complete, a new strategy and action plan will be developed. Action 1 of the Suicide Prevention Action Plan commits the National Suicide Leadership Group to make recommendations on supporting the development and delivery of local prevention action plans and is backed by £3 million of funding over the course of this current Parliament. Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, Minister, Neil's Hugs is a charity in my constituency that supports families and friends affected by suicide. And they say that our top priorities must be to ensure that no one who has attempted suicide should leave hospital without immediate follow-up support. And also, we must reduce waiting times for child and adolescent mental health services. So given the NHS Lothian are a poorer performing health board in this regard, how will the Minister ensure that we do more earlier to prevent poor mental health and suicide? Cabinet Secretary. Um, I'm aware of the charity that uh, Angela Conson speaks of and Donna Patterson Harvey, the Chief Executive of Neil's Hubs Foundation, has been involved in the lived experience events hosted by the Health and Social Care Alliance for the National Suicide Prevention Leadership Group and I thank her for her participation in that as well as others with lived experience. Um, the member will also be aware that last year the Scottish Government and COSLA announced a joint task force on children and young people's mental health and the task force is examining our whole approach to mental health services. Specialist clinical services are not the whole answer and other services in young people's lives are vital to provide practical and emotional support, including education, social work and the third sector. Question number eight, Kezia Dugdale. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that some tattoo parlours are refusing services to customers who disclose their HIV status. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Like the member, I'm concerned to hear of the difficulties that some HIV positive people are experiencing in getting a tattoo. I'm clear that there is absolutely no place for HIV stigma in today's Scotland. The standard infection control procedures that all tattoo studios should have in place provide protection against transmission of bloodborne viruses, including HIV. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. Can I confirm that it's actually a breach of the Equality Act to refuse service to somebody because of their HIV status and ask him to encourage local authorities where these tattoo parlours exist to revoke the licences of those who are discriminating against HIV people? Minister. I think, I think the, the member makes a very important point. Um, I understand that HIV Scotland is working with um, British HIV Association to develop a consensus statement on this matter. And once that statement is available, um, we'll ask local authorities to highlight this to all tattoo studio studios. This should not be happening in Scotland. And I think we need to, to raise awareness and, and it's part of that tackling stigma that I think we all want to, to achieve. Thank you. Question number nine, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it can take in response to Christian persecution overseas. Cabinet Secretary Aileen Campbell. The Scottish Government condemns all incidents of religious persecution and the targeting of innocent people based on their beliefs. The appalling attacks in Sri Lanka and Christchurch highlight the need for continued international effort to end religious persecution. The First Minister wrote offering condolences and solidarity to the people of Sri Lanka and New Zealand and the Scottish Government has repeatedly raised concerns over religious persecution overseas with the UK Government. The Scottish Government is committed to ensuring that Scotland is a modern, inclusive nation which protects, respects and realises internationally recognised human rights. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and we, the Scottish Conservatives, align ourselves with the um, comments about the atrocities in Sri Lanka. 80% of people who suffer persecution because of their faith are Christian, which is nearly 250 million people across the world. Scotland has a proud Christian heritage, and the UK government recently launched a review into the response into persecution of Christians abroad. I hope the Cabinet Secretary um, will join me in welcoming this. Can I ask what support the Scottish government can provide to ensure Christians are protected here in Scotland, and what action it is taking to prevent hatred towards religious groups through better education? 
Cabinet Secretary. I absolutely welcome any efforts to ensure that we uh, continue to provide uh, support to people around the world, but also to build on our, our vision, which is a, a modern, inclusive uh, world which respects and realises uh, internationally recognised human rights and protects people who want to practise their faith. I also um, would uh, happily meet with uh, uh, Rachel Hamilton to discuss this uh, further given time constraints but absolutely we might pro provide support through Interfaith Scotland the dialogue that we have to promote uh, and support uh, international uh, interfaith uh, work to ensure that we can create that tolerant uh, society that modern inclusive Scotland that I think we all uh, support and want to see achieved uh, and we continue to do that through working with uh, Interfaith Scotland other faith groups and certainly af after following the Sri Lanka uh, uh, attacks I wrote to uh, many members of the Christian faith in Scotland to make sure that we stood in solidarity with them, to support them uh, and to make sure that they understood that we stood in solidarity with them here in Scotland but also uh, widely, uh, wide, more widely across the world as well. Thank you very much and that concludes general questions and before we turn to First Minister's questions uh, could I invite members to join me in welcoming to our gallery the Honourable Sue Hickey, Speaker of the Tasmanian House of Assembly. Thank you.